Hi, and welcome to... I don't want to see myself. Fuck it. Okay. Just, what? Uh, just a second. So annoying. Okay, there we go. I just want to see all these... I'll just leave my questions. I guess we're going to have to... Wait. It's just, it's just shocking sometimes, you know. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just. I want to just detach this little guy, but well, whatever. It doesn't matter that much. I can just put it right. And I'm, and I'm the only one in it. <laughs> I'm trying to, trying to get that. What you, could you drag it? Could you make it really short and drag it all the way up? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm sure there's ways to do all that. Okay, well, whatever. This is fine. You can just bring it out. Preach. Make sure it's recorded. Yeah, it's recording. Okay, great. Cool. Hi, and welcome to the State of Human Design, Tuesday, September 28th. I'm your host, Jonah Dempsey, and here's my guest, Michael Steenbeck Littman. Today we're going to be talking about a number of topics in the human design world in the past month. So, um... The first thing that I'm really interested in, what has happened in human design Twitter? Oh, that's our first subject? I know. I, I threw a curve there. They were, they were going out of order. That was a different order there. I just yeah. have to know, though. I have to know. Well, we were playing a, on talking about this kind of when it was going on, but there was like a, a sudden interest in human design on Twitter, probably in August or so because of a few um, key spiritual influence, influencers kind of blew it up single-handedly. Um, you know, because before that, human design was a very, very dead topic on Twitter. Like, hardly anyone was posting about it. Um, but now it's like, yeah, there, there's much more of a wave. And then it was like that for maybe, like, let's say six weeks or so. And then there was a new level of backlash against human design on Twitter. And that's happened before. I get, also, obviously, but on a, on a much smaller scale because of the much smaller interests. Um, I, I, I haven't seen this, you know, I the only time I ever really see backlash uh, on human design in the places that I, I look, every now and then I'll see something on Reddit that's really critical, and then every now and then I'll see something on Facebook, but I'm also, I'm not really hip to the Twitter human design world. So well, I mean, it, it, that's what I mean. It kind of like hasn't existed hardly until like a few months ago. Okay, so there we go. So so what are some of the the backlashes that you've been seeing against human design? I think that those of us who've been with human design for a while, these will all be kind of uh, familiar controversies to us. Um, that the that the system is cultural appropriation. That the the system is a multi level marketing scheme or a cult. Um, that raw is problematic. Oh, that it's inherently capitalistic. That it's that the description of generators as slaves is some sort of endorsement from raw. <laughs> you know, so well, I mean, he was a manifester, so you know that one might be that one might be true. But uh, no, but I do, I do. I some of these are familiar, but some of these are not necessarily familiar. But I. But I imagined that somebody would come up with them, which is always really satisfying. What, which which had you never heard before? Thanks. Well, the forty four twenty six, for instance, when I was reading the forty four twenty six, and I remember um, thinking to myself, you know, people who who are more thirty seven forty side of it sometimes don't want to believe that 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 cold bloodedness is part of our human nature and they want to imagine a human being that's only ego and solar plexus not ego and spleen mm. and you know because of the channel of communism mm. and so i have friends for instance who have told me you know being a therapist to a banker is just as bad as being a banker or, you know things like that these really you know really terrible views from the so-called communist side from that's the 3740 kind of an, an when it comes to cold bloodedness yeah I mean, it's so true. funny it's so yeah it's like leave them out in the, in the cold leave them on the cold blooded side but leave them out in the cold no but in any case the the 4426 to me is one that i remember when i was reading uh, you know we're all talking about it the channel of the entrepreneur and the capitalist and all this stuff and I remember just hearing, particularly in his in his work on quarter by quarter, uh, Faces of the Godhead, also um, when he would do the uh, you know incarnation crosses by profile. These are the ones where he really gets into the nitty gritty and actually spent a couple of years really just going 
gate by gate, line by line. And when he gets to the, you know, 4426, he's talking about capitalism and, and, and what it is and what it is to be an entrepreneur. To be clear, the stream of capitalism starts in the 54. Okay, good point, good point. And it ends in the... Um, it, it, it ends there with the... Oh, and the ego. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. It's 54, 32, 44, 26. And then the stream of communism begins in 1949. Mm -hmm. So that's so or interesting. Socialism, I think they call it. Socialism. Okay, that's so interesting to me that that 1949, you know, seems to me to have nothing to do with communism. I mean, even that's an interesting topic in and of itself, or socialism, which I, do, I know are, are different things, and there's many different interpretations of each. Um, but, you know, the the... Yeah, it's it, it these these kind of when you're learning human design, you're discovering that there are these capacities built into humans, um, and, and this is right, and that you're just seeing these capacities, and some people just don't want to see that that capacity exists, and will then blame the person for characterizing that capacity and saying you're characterizing it in a way that justifies it or rationalizes it in some way, and I don't think that's true at all. I think that's shooting the messenger. So, but, uh, you know, staying on our topic, human design on Twitter, so it's, it's new. It's completely new in the last few months. I mean, for it to really be a, a scene discourse, a scene yeah. where people are commenting and retweeting right, right. and replying. And, and, uh, and so, I mean, you know, how did this start? I mean, you said there are some Instagram influencers kind of began to... Um, take note of human design or tweet about human design was yeah, yeah yeah basically just really influential people in the spiritual community all of a sudden getting into human design practicing it speaking about it i don't really keep up with you know the full output of what these people are doing the, but there are astrologers to the stars uh, yeah yeah um, i think they practice all kinds of modalities and, yeah and it's also also interesting because i think it, it appears that they got into human design relatively recently and um and didn't wait too long before starting to tweet about it. So you kind of get to watch their discovery of it unfold. And you're kind of left wondering, like, how how big a part of their lives is this going to be? Like, how long are they going to hang on to it? Because some people do get into human design for, like, a second and then drop it, right? Right. No, it's true. So, well, it's interesting to see who, who really, you know, uh, one person, for instance, had um, set her manifestation goal to make one million dollars and she succeeded in that goal through what is kind of mlm i mean that's what's funny is it's actually the people that are further out who are accusing human design of being mlm who are doing mlm -y stuff but you know they don't realize that they're all outside of they're equally outside of human design um but okay but i mean yeah i, I think the, the clip that stayed with me as you said uh you know pe people nowadays who are astrologers from the stars are kind of modern day court astrologers and it's interesting when, if you think about historically how power structures have, have worked and how there have been court astrologers and how astrology has always been used as a seven-centered system. Tool of control. Tool, yeah, it's been a tool for the court astrologer to really only give something useful for the people in power to keep their power. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The reflectors, right, working for the manifestor game. <laughs> yeah, so, that's uh, the kind of, that's the classic trope is the, you know, reflectors are, you know, noticing where there's unrest and basically trying to root out the unrest. Mm -hmm. And we live in a nine centered paradigm now where That's we, we the, no longer- That's the antagonist of 1984. <laughs> you know the guy, the guy. Oh. Who, you know that's like his whole thing. Is, oh know, yeah. yeah, that's the well. It what did, didn't wasn't the author a reflector, or am I thinking of maybe I'm conflating him with HG HG Wells? No, I think I'm conflating him with HG uh, Wells. We'll have to we'll have to look this up. Anyway, sidebar. Yeah, but um, in any case, yeah, the the. Yeah, we'll have to yeah, it'd be fun to edit. So, to to see that in post. <laughs> now that we have post, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> We can talk about whatever. We can talk about <coughs> Having post, it's really an upgrade. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> it's an upgrade in life. Okay, so we have a lot of interesting content to cover. Uh, as far as the, the Twitter question, uh, are you on Twitter? If so, what is your human design Twitter experience? Please please post in the comments. Oh, yeah, because it is, a and it is a, you know, Twitter can be such a powerful tool of networking, and that element of it with the HD discourse has not started to take off super much and there are people out there that feel like they're the only manifestor they can talk to or whatever and they want to meet other manifestors through Twitter or there's I notice a thing with uh, six lines you know six lines are always looking for people at other stages to use as examples you know 
Oh, because they're the role model themselves, right? Yeah. It's the example. Like, Let's see some yeah. examples of this. Let's, yeah. Oh, that's a good one. So, so I do encourage people to get on the Twitter to connect and provide more HD representation. Because, you know, and also with yeah. literally when you're working with the science of differentiation, the more differentiated the voices are who are speaking about the subjects, you provide that much more accessibility, you know? And, like, because anyone can go off on human design and it would be a unique take, you know? Mm. Well, that's a very charitable, um, charitable idea because, you know, and this is to me, I'm going to turn off the, this is going to be, I need a little Jonah rant, you know, emoji title here, but there's a, a Deleuze quote that I just absolutely love, um, which is basically on conversation and, um, let's see if we can get it here. Okay, well, I'll just summarize it. So what he says is the, the problem with most discussion is, the, is not that people aren't speaking. It's not that, you know, there's this kind of... He was writing this in the 80s, but it was really from that 70s, 80s ethos, but it's still there today that we have to fully express ourselves. That ultimately we haven't been able to speak, and there's this beautiful moment when we're able to speak our truth. Mm. Well, he's a bit more cynical than that. He says, no, the problem isn't that people aren't speaking. The problem is that they're, they're, they're just saying homogenized things. They're saying things that don't matter one iota because they're things that have been said before. And you cannot criticize what they're saying because it's not wrong. You can't even really disagree with it. Oh, yeah. It's not wrong, it's just trite. I mean, that's not his term for it, but it's, it's it hard to find real conversation. There's a great James Hillman quote as well, and I do think there's a lot of resonances between Deleuze and Hillman, where Hillman says, good conversation is more than mere discussion. It kind of elevates um, the conversation to a place where it echoes, where it's resonant, where you start to, you know, something comes to life. Something grows. Something grows there. There is life there. By the way, there. impossible to do in uh, a greater group than a pentagon. If you have six people together sharing a conversation, they're not actually sharing a conversation. Nothing can develop in that. That's such a good point. It's so hard. It keeps going back to basics. You were the first one to point this out. I remember, you know, Mike and I have shared a lot of fun human design observations over the years, and I was doing a lot of penta observation. I had observed when you first go to a party, the first penta you bond with, you keep coming back to again and again and again. You're and at home I, island. <laughs> yeah, it's your home island. You just keep coming back to your home. People, whoever it happened to be, they could be strangers, and you could have your friends there, but you're not part of your friend's penta because your friend showed up with some other friends. Mm -hmm. And the strangers were the first people that you ran into or something. So you just keep, you have this bond. Whoa, and, also a good example of how parties tend to be markets. Interesting, yeah, you get paired up with people mm -hmm. who are, you know, I mean, more specific, right? And precise and, and, and different. Um, yeah, well, just the us yeah. and them dynamic that's like a part of a staple of market environments. Oh, us and them us dynamic. The people we trade with, right? And also the people that we see every week whose names we don't know. Right? Because yeah, they're all or that's so true. We, yeah, you can get. That's a really interesting way to look at it. It's very particular. It's very specific to your sources and so on. That's really cool. Um, okay, so we have uh, the next topic: bodygraph, uh, bodygraphchart.com, and this is a website. Uh, here we are. Nope. Oh, that's not how I moved it. Okay. So this is a new chart that is an API for generating body graphs. And this is this is pretty cool. Um, it's something that I'm really glad exists, that's just really neat that's out there. It basically, it, it allows people to um, create arbitrary charts. I mean, you can generate charts, you can, you can um, use it for your own website if you wanna make a, a website that is able to generate charts for clients. Uh, you know, it has a whole API. It's actually made by people who love astrophysics and astronomy. So it seems to be very solid in its nice logic. Insight. Yeah, they've really done a great job. I saw that, you know, for instance, even with PDF, they, they don't allow you to generate PDF right off the bat, but they were like, we know how to do this. Just contact us, you know, and hi you can hire us to build your own custom PDF. Yeah. They have, yeah, desktop apps for Windows. Um, they're, they're pretty cool. I mean, yeah, WordPress. And it's 50 bucks a month, which sounds like a lot, but they're really aimed at other businesses. Mm. 
and that's for up to 50,000 requests a month, which is pretty standard for APIs. That's what, I mean, that's a lot. I mean, human design is not that popular. Uh, generating 50,000 human design charts a month. I mean, it's interesting. It is surprising how much it gets out there. There, there are, is the Rave Statistics website as well, um, which, which I think was run for many years. It, it's, so yeah, it's on Jovian Archive. And uh, I mean, you can see that there are something like, let's see how many charts have been generated. Um, okay, it doesn't, oh yeah, there we go. There have been 36,200,000 charts generated since this website has been on. And I've seen that grow from a much smaller number. But even with the 36 million charts, and you know, some people like me have generated hundreds of charts on this site. Some of them just for historical figures. I mean, there's a lot of duplicate historical figures and so on. I mean, I once ran a chart for Frankenstein's monster. Exactly, and we had a conversation about a chart. I mean, there's a conversation in the, in the there's a thread on the Human Design Catalyst group about a chart for Google, for Google's, for Google the company, for when Google was founded. Does that work? I don't know. It was founded during an 1858. I think this was Google's birthday. I mean, if people are celebrating it, it starts to... It's just how do you interpret it? You know, you can interpret Saturn return charts and you don't interpret them the same way that you interpret that someone's actual body graph. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's what interpretive power does it have? That's an open question. Right. It's, it's important to investigate these because things. Because what gates see. are there to receive in a transpersonal entity, right? What get, like... Because we have different gates than animals, so you think that that would be a different kind of creature that would have different reason. I'm sure. Yeah, I think it would more be. Yeah, right. I, I'm not sure what would exactly be imprinted at that point, but you might be able to see that the entire world at that juncture was. I mean, you could maybe do something kind of like Richard Tarnas's Cosmos and Psyche, where you're you're basically able to look at the. You, you might be able to glean some information, some interesting information, but it remains to be seen what that would be. In Saturn cycles, for instance, the most interesting information I found is the incarnation cross, the profile, and the nodes. Mm -hmm. And that is so much of it that if you can actually interpret that and track that and have some interpretive value from that, um, you know, you've already accomplished so much that I'm not sure the extra value you're gaining from the other aspects of the Saturn cycle. There mm -hmm. probably is some and it can be interpreted, but I'm just saying that, you know, um, the interpretive value of human design it changes at each level. And when you're doing an individual chart versus a partnership chart, right, if partnership has definition together, it doesn't mean at all the same thing as definition in an individual chart. Right. Partnership definition means you're activating that for each other, but that's going to depend on how each of you has developed or not, you know, that say that neither person has the um, center activated and then neither has the center activated they have an you know electromagnetic together that can go swimmingly or that can go very very poorly right you can get anger if that's uh you know if, i mean you can get the not self you can get either side of that binary and it also depends on the lines i've been noticing how if you have a second line you're just going to try it out well, maybe, maybe you'll get it right, but over time, right? If you have a first line, you might not even notice, for instance, you have a 12-1 and you're you know, electromagnetically connecting to a 22, and they might have a 22-5. They might see you just clearly, but you don't even notice they're there because your 12-1 is not really equipped to communicate to them. What it's saying is more... You know, what is the nature of communication? That's what all the first lines in the throat are doing. So some, so my point is just, there's so many nuances of it, but what we're doing when we're using human design, um, actually, this is a great segue. Uh, so yeah, by the way, check out, you know, Body Graph Chart, great site. This is a great segue to the Martin Grassinger interview on the Human Design Collective podcast. Oh, what did this man have to say? Well, it, it was just, it was fantastic, and he he said that he uses human design as a toolbox and this toolbox like we have to be careful how we interpret it basically saying the same kind of idea of you don't just interpret things um, 
you know, he, he had a really good example where he was saying you could see something so negative. Mm-hmm. And this also kind of harkens back to the backlash against human design, of, you know, one of the most common ones being it's so negative. And saying, um, for instance, um, he was talking about some of the more negative lines, and I know that I think of the 28-6, uh, which is the blaze of glory, uh-huh. sacrifice rather than capitulation to the law of deterioration, uh, in detriment, the self-destruction, deep intuitive fear of defeat, prof- profound, potentially profound hopelessness in times of struggle. I mean, it's, but you know, you see, you see that, or, um, or the uh, thirty-two-six, you know, which is a different kind. It's not the sudden, the sudden suicide of the twenty-eight-six. It's the slow death over a, over a long time of the drinking, smoking, and things like that. It's because it's gate- about this in the interview. Yeah, cool. yeah. And so his point was, you take these, these are the two examples he used. And he also used the example, and I mean, uh, he's a fourth line, and I can see how I'm a bit more heretical in my views in that he continues to sort of externalize what I would consider a seven-centered rhetoric of healing, and it seems to be catered towards an audience where he sees himself as the sort of healer of them, and and so on, and there's, but at the same time, and you need to be cautious of that. It's cross appealing, right? <laughs> and I mean, that's my own interpretation to myself of that. But I think everyone does. Uh, but you know, I would just say that he had two really good examples of of how. So the the first one was actually um, changing the idea of pressure, the pressure center of the root, to that being the joy center. And I like that, but I like that maybe for a different reason than he does. I don't like it in the sort of because you know. Karen Curry Parker is also a four six. You see, and I don't have a problem with her. I love the four sixes, but they externalize positivity because then you start with something positive and you're creating a positive world and it's positive this and that and that and that. And I'm just, I don't start with the positive. I start with the different. And if everything's positive, there's nothing different. I don't prescribe to the Sunshine School of, of Psychology, the California Sunshine School of Psychology, as James Holman would call it. I mean. Yeah, gene keys, exactly. And I also see how the fourth line continues to build on what they've already learned, and they don't ever actually overthrow. I've, I've likened them to CDRs, not CDRWs, which is something I've gotten in trouble for. <laughs> but I think it's that they, they continue to build on. So I love Martin Grassinger. I mean, to me, this is, he's one of the most brilliant uh, you know, human design researchers out there. I, I'm just also saying that there is something you know, we have very different interpretations because he's saying we should change pressure to joy because people make all these associations with joy that are positive and we start with positivity. I think we should change it to joy so we actually rob them of the excuse that they have for stressing out about things. They say, oh, it's so stressful. I have such much pressure. You're enjoying it. Don't, don't, you know, try to convince me you're not enjoying this. So I, you know, I'm a little bit darker in my interpretation Mm. of it. Um, But in any case, so that was the first example the root what? center to me is such a pilot light, you know? It's such a it's striking a match or whatever. And when a light turns on like that, it does seem like joy. Joy is a great word for it. I love seeing, I mean, the joyous is not the only joy gate, right? I mean, I have the joyous, but I also see the joy of concentration, the joy of stillness, the joy of, there's a lot of joy in it. The joy of flirting. I mean, it's a real joy to flirt. It's the joy of fighting. People who mm-hmm. actually fight really enjoy fighting, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's right. a joy in all of these these root gates. So, and I think Martin Martin Grassinger is completely brilliant. I don't mean to, you know, criticize his brilliance in any way. I'm just saying his role as a fourth line is not the role of the heretic. It is the role of the externalizer. And we each have our roles. Maybe because I'm base two, I, I'm so attuned to role, and I'm always pointing out people's roles, and it's kind of a very much a recognition of those roles. And I can see he's doing incredible work. He's also doing a tremendous amount of original research. So I don't mean to say that the fourth line is only going to externalize write something from somebody else. He's done more original research than I have. It's just a little more heretical for me to to stick to um, a maybe a little darker interpretation of a lot of these things. But in any case, so then he, he goes to the darker lines, but he says something really brilliant. What he says is the people that he knows in his life who have these lines aren't living out those dark sides at all because they are aware of it. So they know what those things are and they're staying away from them. Someone with gate 32, line six, the need to calmly face impermanence, indetrinant, the impermanence as proof of meaninglessness with depression, delusion, and at the extreme self-destruction, wow. right? The potential for depression, self-destruction, all this stuff. It's really, um, 
it makes sense that all the root gates, really, not just the format gates, are real potentials for depression. We always look at the format gates as the kind of depression signatures. If someone has a, like you have a hanging nine, you would need a 52, theoretically, because we're all so interdependent. One of your interdependencies built in is that there would be a certain restless depression without a hanging 52 around. Mm. And the same for anybody who has a 52 without a 9. The same for anyone with a 3 without a 60 or vice versa. 42 and 53 or vice versa. But I think what we are seeing is that, yeah, the other the other root gates, it's also true. Um, so, yeah, Mar Martin, uh, you know, Ms. Ms. Mr. Grassinger talks about the 32-6. And uh, I have a question. Yeah, please. Well, so then what does differentiate the format channels from other fuels? They're just all encompassing. I mean, say I have um, the 1858, and say I have every other channel except the format channels mm -hmm. in the root, and then I have one format channel. It's going to kind of dominate in a way that even those other six channels mm -hmm. won't. So it's interesting that the 1858 does not dominate. It's mm -hmm. waiting there mm -hmm. dormantly mm -hmm. to be invited right. to share right and then it comes to life right. or so on it but needs it, an investment of energy whereas the, all the format channels supply their own energy yeah the sacral and the root are both motors right. so it's a little bit like the uh, power of that 3740 which is between the ego and the solar plexus oh. also between two motors oh, okay. or the defense circuitry of the 596 right. is the, the solar plexus and the sacral. But you know those other ones between two motors also need invitation because they're also projected channels, the solar plexus. Or oh, I see what you're saying, yeah. It, well, it's a good point, right? They're gonna be either generated or, oh, I guess even the 3740 is projected. It's a good point. I think it's just a difference when it's when it's a sacral. The aura comes about because of the yeah. sacral center. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, th that also externalizes in a way, or that emanates in a way that other channels don't. Channels That's a that good point. It's broadcasting. Yeah. I've noticed that the format channels fill up a room. Like yeah. I walk into a room and it's unconscious for me. I didn't even realize it before human design because it's completely on my design side. But I have a design 952 and I just sit in the room and then, you know, the concentration starts to happen and it, it can make other people concentrate too. Mm -hmm. Um, it certainly can. Well, I, I do think just to talk about Martin Grassinger's interview, to me, when I heard this, this is I mean, I've heard his work before, and I've been very much interested in, in it and kind of bookmarked it for when I'm ready to go more into the amino acids, when I'm ready to go more into just some of the more scientific aspects of it. Uh, but I hadn't really understood. From listening today, I think I've understood his personality type. I think he's a lead blast INTJ, so he's an intuitive thinker, and having such a strong intuitive thinking is, and to be such a clear speaker um, is, is just really a treat. And so I highly recommend everybody to listen to the Martin Grassinger uh, podcast, Human Design Collective, of course, Amy Lee and John Cole. They're just fantastic. And um, do, do be sure to listen to that. All right. And it is now time for our last topic. Which we only have three topics. Well, we've done we've done Twitter, we've done the body graph, and we've done uh, Martin Grassinger. So now we have random question time, and this will be this is our this is our fun topic right here. This is fun times. Bonus round, cool. What's on the docket? Yeah, uh, um, I have a number of random questions. Atlantis. <laughs> uh. <laughs> You want to expand on that? <laughs> Atlantis? <laughs> question mark? Well, why don't you tell me why you're bringing up Atlantis here? I, I, kinda, you, I went off observe? on somebody about Atlantis. <laughs> okay, you know, right. I, I have the Human Design Catalyst group, and I sometimes <laughs> go off on people. <laughs> Someone posted in the group about Atlantis. And about, well, here's the next the next question. So I guess these are two in one. Okay. Drunvelo Melchizedek? Uh-huh. I've heard of this guy. <laughs> Well, those two things were mentioned together, and, you know, along with, you know... Do we know what... Okay, we can talk about Atlantis. Do we know what Drunvalo Melchizedek says about Atlantis? I or know you that... Get, you got I know first. that years ago when I researched him, 15 years ago, I found him to be kind of lacking. Like, he said that we were all going to dematerialize and that everything that was inorganic... He, he basically introduced this whole idea of organic and inorganic, which has enter, entered into a kind of weird sphere of conspiracy theory weirdness 
where there's inorganic people and there's organic people and it doesn't really mean anything. None of it means anything. He said, it, I think it was in 2000 or something, that we, all the stuff was going to dematerialize. CDs would dematerialize. Computers would dematerialize. Mm. Our clothes, because they're made of synthetic fibers, would dematerialize. This seems kind of anti-form. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, my, my main stance is that nothing in human design disagrees with anything that we know in science to be a fact. Because there's a lot that we don't know in science. And there's a lot that human design claims that we don't know, which may or may not ever be proven by science. Mm. But what science claims is not directly invalidated by anything in human design. And our scientific evidence points to the fact that Atlantis is wrong what about and Tron is wrong. What about the personality crystal? How could that exist? How could there be a material object so small that only one neutrino passes through it at a time? Oh, I mean, it's not material in the sense we're talking about it. It would probably be dark matter or dark... Oh. Dark energy you know I mean the thing is my, my point is just that you don't need to have I mean you could actually understand human design completely as a literal as literal as possible fig I mean it's like it's like a like a literal um, description as literal as possible being the ones and zeros of the actual nucleotides of the DNA ribosomes and all of that stuff where if you see those little spines of the DNA each one of those is actually two lines because there's four different values um, the A, C, you know, and so on. And, um, you know, without being too technical about it, you could actually imagine how, in the conventional scientific explanation of single cell organisms, life evolving out of an environment of basically being a, a sort of primordial sludge or slime. Mm -hmm that this primordial slime of life was in an environment where that it was being pelted by so many um you know new, it was being pelted by a consistent re repetitive pattern of neutrinos the exact same every single year for hundreds and hundreds of billions of years mm -hmm. and it's being repetitive 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 until just like how scientists understand the eye responded to be able to see by photons pelting against something that became softer and softer and softer and ultimately weak enough to let the photons through mm. so the photons began to penetrate through similarly the neutrinos through yes. you know eventually organizing the matter essentially yeah. organized the matter into what gave rise to dna right and the dna itself was formed in an environment of repetitive uh, programming of only four fundamental operations, which are the four fundamental types of, um, you know, nucleotides. So it's just, mm -hmm. a, I mean, you know, I, I'm not a NT blaster like Martin Grassinger, and I, I wish I were, or, or six Dario Um Yeah. I, oh, I guess so. Wait, are there six? No, no there's only, only two or three flavors. There's six. There's many sixes. I think neutrinos maybe only have three flavors. There are maybe they have three the quarks and three. And th well, there's three quarks and three leptons, which form a nice six. There's there the are also, system. right, there are three neutrinos, the electron, the muon, and the tau. But, um, but they all have the complements, right? And right, they have antineutrinos. Each okay, one has antineutrinos. So that's why they're yeah, six. So the, the pair of, the, if you pair the neutrinos and the antineutrinos, and then if you do the quarks and the leptons. Very I mean, tonal. We see why tone is the middle of the crystal. Right? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, um, and, the neutrinos. and you know, the point where Ra was talking about human design, neutrinos were not known to have multiple flavors. And so, it's, but anyway, there's, there's a lot of really beautiful and really kind of wonderful mysteries here. So, but the mysteries of science are good enough for me. I don't need the mysteries of Atlantis. I don't need the mysteries of Richard Rudd saying that that all of Gene Keys came from the three great teachers of humanity, Jesus, Buddha, and Hermes Trismestigus, okay? Oh, cool. I don't need these sort of figurative things making their, I don't need a bunch That's of- It's a nice collab. I, I don't need all this uh, water muddying up my nice dry logic here, you know what I mean? I mean, this is, this is like, keep the, keep your abstraction out of my logic. Wow, and so that's what I have to say. Your son's an abstraction. Yeah, You're, but I also have the format energy of logic, and I also understand the, the value of keeping them separate. I mean, and the, the point is just, we have a hard enough time elevating the conversation. It's like, it's not that, it's not even that, okay, so first of all, somebody can be wrong, and if they're wrong, then it's just wrong. 
But then beyond being wrong, most of the time the things that people are saying aren't actually wrong or they're not wrong according to a certain legalistic interpretation of something. They've just been said before. And this is what this I is get back Deleuze to with Deleuze. Thing, yeah. yeah, it's just been said before. Well, and then, but then his other side of that was that the complement to truth is interest, right? That there's an in, and so if someone is telling a good myth or whatever and it's interesting, then that's like... Yeah, it's, it's true. If it's interesting, so that's the real question is, is what Dwin Vala Melch is that inter <laughs> saying interesting? <laughs> trying and there to, are correct answers to these, to these or subjective aesthetic yeah. questions, right? Yeah, I would just <laughs> search anyone... There are appropriate answers to whether this guy, what this guy is saying is interesting. Well, I mean, <laughs> because the, the point would just be if he's, if he's been saying it before, I mean, certain people are going to find things interesting right. that are just not going to be interesting to other people, but or that's... Just at other times. Because right. it's like if the myth is what gets you into the science later on, then the myth was correct in getting you where you needed to go. You know what I mean? Like the the when Jung called feeling a rational function or whatever, that rationality was predicated on appropriateness, which it, it means that's always context dependent or whatever. And the correct answer to yeah. the feeling problem is whether it's appropriate, and that it can never be repeated. Because the story that someone's weaving can be perfectly appropriate for one audience or even the same person at different times. You have to match. It's, it's resonance matching, right? It's sure. Finding, yeah, you want to find the right thing to explain yeah. what's going on for them. Yeah. Well, I guess what I'm saying is there, the other thing that feeling teaches us is that, see, because it's, it's the rejection of true inferiority that's the rejection of feeling. Mm. True superiority and inferiority of, for instance, art or of a thought or an idea or anything. And so, you know, some people think they've written a little guitar song and they think that they should be on the radio and then they go, oh, Drake is on the radio. Well, that's only because of nepotism mm -hmm. and because the world is bad. We call these people haters. Oh, yeah. So haters do have do not have a, enough of a differentiated feeling nice. and thinking functions working together in tandem where the thinking is able to appreciate things for their purely functionality mm -hmm. and then the feeling is able to appreciate aesthetics and what happens is there's a real denigration of feeling when people kind of pretend that it's all relative and that Dranvalo Melchizedek could be equivalently valuable as the teachings of Raghu or equivalently something else valuable. Right, there's no equivalence in value. The value, there's no such thing as equivalence, right? right? It's all unique. Yeah. And the unique value of Drenvelo is, you know, probably to actually test someone's BS meter. And the unique <laughs> value of a human design system is to actually teach you something that you can use throughout your life. Mm. But they're very different things. I mean, I love to, yeah, it's very rare that I see Mike get angry and he's going to edit this out, I know. But, angry about what? No, not angry, but uh, he did, I guess. It was when you had, uh, you showed me your great response about the value of astrology versus the value of human design. Oh. And you oh, said yeah, yeah. astrology is basically good when we're all trying to compete over limited resources to <laughs> defeat each other, you know. A, I don't know how you subjugate put it. Subjugate nature. Yeah, subjugate author, nature, yeah. become like the, yeah, like that was the seven centered goal. I mean, it's funny, it's kind of like waking up, the, we're in this very sobering age and it's the age of the nine centered you know, wokeness means we've, we're waking up with a bad hangover from having right. trashed the world. Right. I, I loved last night in our, you know, Human Design Catalyst, probably to me the most profound realization was that we're moving from future-oriented to past-oriented mm, uh, consciousness, right. that we're moving from the splenic binary through the Ajna binary to the solar plexus binary, which is the most past-oriented, and how funny that is to be part of the so-called woke culture which then looks back at the past and goes oh my word what the hell did humans do to each other and it's actually some solace to know that before 1781 they actually were literally different creatures right. we are not we are not that human we are they not homo the same effective capacity we are homo transits yeah it actually makes me feel better to know that people who were suffering did not feel that suffering but it still gives me all the more hor i mean as much as we do because we have the increased capacity of the solar plexus to actually feel this is an increased sensitization if you will however i still would never justify the horrors of the past and you know it's it's also at a time where the human defense system is breaking down um you know something controversial ra said is that you know with the rise of hiv we were probably always exposed to it it was just that the human 
DNA and the human genome, human immune system, and all of this is going away and is breaking down, and so it can no longer fight against things that we could have easily fought against. Our T cells could have destroyed that virus, but the T cells themselves are weakening because of the waning human life force. We are, we as humanity, are becoming sickly and fading, as it were, which is another one of those dark things that goes very much against the very seven-centered healing narrative of wholeness. Cool. You know, as much as I love... Very dark souls. And as much as I... Yeah, as much as I love Jung, I do have a, it's an issue with Jung's wholeness metaphor, although I think Jung himself noticed this as well, which is the megalomania of identifying with that image of wholeness. We have to really understand that we are actually just a small fragment and that the wholeness is our 64 gates, our nine centers, our 36 channels. We are but the life force energy flickering in the dark, vastness of that wholeness mm. in the attempts to be everything and to be every gate and to be every channel is the not self. It literally is the not self. And that's why a lot of people are affronted by human design because you're telling them, no, you're not this. And they're going, my whole life I've, I've been this. I've always been the one who's really good at blank. And it quite literally is blank. It's the empty part of the chart. Well, so then how do we reconcile that with this, the illusion of separateness created by the magnetic monopole? I mean, that, that that is just how we have a matrix, so to speak. It's basically we couldn't, if we couldn't differentciate, if we, we wouldn't really be able to. Um, I mean, it, I think what, what, what the magnetic monopole's role really is, is to hold it all together. It's really like, it's almost like the bootstrapping of individuality of creating yeah. separate entities and it, and it enforces certain and rules like, in the literal physical body right keeping all this stuff attached. yeah i mean it really is an interesting thing to think of the, all the cells and, all that. and to think of the personality and the design also and yeah it's the it's the sort of prime design crystal that acts as a coordinating agency for each design crystal within each cell mm -hmm. i had an interesting thought that you know the reason the deconditioning is so profound is that just as each human is imprinted at the moment of birth mm -hmm. Which, by the way, is not the first breath or the first opening of the eyes, but is when the body is completely outside of the other body, because that's when the environment changes. Gravity is not felt in, in the same way in a sort of anti-gravity environment oh. within, within the womb. Wow, that's and it's very actually the hitting of the womb, and it's all of the yeah, and it's so. I mean, the, the you know being of gravity being outside of the womb, and, um, and of no longer having amniotic fluid. So it really is is the being out of. Uh, yeah, but um, receiving the neutrinos for yourself through every yeah, cell. Yeah, yeah, for every cell exactly, cell. exactly. And so that's what imprints us in the beginning. But what's interesting is the reason it can take so long. And something else I really liked that Martin Grassinger said was that it, it took him probably um, three Saturn cycles to really get to the point where he'd internalized the deconditioning. And it's because as the cells are as the cells go away and new cells are generated through abiogenesis or however it's cellular genesis that you know occurs um these new cells are formed and uh and they they are now formed with their new design crystals and each new cell has its own new design crystal which is effectively tuned at a certain frequency and so that new design crystal takes in a new imprint at the time of the formation of the cell it was interesting to me and i would never advise anyone to do this um, and I certainly would never, would, as far as I know, could never imagine doing this. But, you know, after Ra's encounter with the voice, he gazed at the sun. Mm. And I just had the thought, you know, what if that actually destroyed a lot of the cells in his eyes, thus forcing cellular regeneration yeah. because he was in some mutative state of increased cellular regeneration that is kind of not known to modern science. You know, I, I believe when you're in these mutative, what have historically been called kundalini awakening states, things like that, who knows what kind of, what could really be going on. He might've been in some state of increased cellular regrowth. So of course he needed to go on these fasts and then lose all this weight and then regenerate the cells. And of course he needed to stare at the sun and burn out the cells of his eyes so that they regenerate. So he doesn't have to wait another seven years or however long for the cells to naturally regenerate. It's a little bit of a forced cellular regeneration. It made me wonder if there is any way to force cellular destruction and regeneration, if that would actually speed up deconditioning because the new cells to come in would effectively be tuned to the new frequency of the person, not the old frequency of the person they were tuned to when they first regenerated. Nice. That's amazing. Interesting idea there. That's really so. cool. Okay. Well, you know, if you want to leave these to the next, I saw that one of the next questions is about fatigue. I'm feeling a bit of fatigue. Mm -hmm. Should we leave these for the next time? Uh, sure. Unless there's anything you're excited about answering. Maybe I'll do the one, the one last one. Oh, but we didn't actually talk about Atlantis. Oh, okay. Well. Well, I don't know. I, guess I, don't know. I I've thought. Well, okay. Do you have any Atlantis? I don't know anything else to say about it. 
Well, because to me, the whole Atlantis thing... Well, so what do you think of Barry Long's thing? Like Barry Long, right? I'm interested in Barry Long, but I don't really believe Barry Long's... I don't know what his... Genesis stuff? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I don't... Like, he talks about, like, there being endless universes and each one, or transverses, as he oh. calls them. Or not endless. I mean, I, I don't I shouldn't, I don't, I shouldn't, I don't want to put words in his mouth. But, I mean, Barry Long is very human design adjacent. And he says some very human design similar things. Like, he says, for instance, life and death is just part of our current reality, but that in a future there will be no life or death. And it's very similar to human design, talking about the era. And he talks about the draconic transverse, where for our amount of time, uh, we're within this single universe that he does kind of describe as a living entity in a very interesting way. Uh, he describes it, uh, you know, as, as mythological. He says myth is the greatest truth we can have. Now, I'm not necessarily familiar with his Atlantis material. I don't know if he's speaking mythologically or trying to say that. The re- I'm just saying I don't believe that there is literally any advanced civilization no, in the past no, because I have not found evidence for that. No physical material I haven't f- found the evidence of that. If somebody shows me the evidence, I would change my mind. Right. Well, so that's always kind of what I took Atlantis and the Maria for, because that's how the Theosophists framed it originally, and the anth- and Rudolf Steiner and all them, you know. For them, and Barry Long has a similar idea where it's like really early in human evolution, we still existed prior to full material incarnation. Our relationship to our bodies was different. It was almost like the bodies were a mirror of our experience at the, during the time that sex was unconscious, right? sort of pre-human mammal, right? And yeah. we know the relationship that mammals have with the dream state. This is like a Neanderthal state in some sense, right. yeah. But even at that time, humans were distinct among mammals, for sure. Like, because we were unfolding this pattern in a way that no other mammal gets to experience. Um, and so, were civilizations being developed that were not full of material? Right, that, that I mean, because Barry and Barry Long does describe this that we emerged out of this sort of inner collective unconscious psychic world where the, where so, the society existed, where what what human society was was in this inner psychic space, or whatever. and that oh. and that coming fully into the body was a major achievement, and these were the first people to wake up in that sense. I mean, that's like, a really beautiful idea because I could imagine that from our perspective. Everything we understand about science is basically true, but the people that were living in caves and drawing the cave paintings had an intense inner psychic world. Mm. And I've been told, for instance, by a stone carver that when he works on the stone, he goes into a trance state where he feels millions of other humans have already been there before. And when Terrence McKenna talks about new designer drugs and you take it for the first time, it's like going to a shiny new office building and being the first person to see it, Mm. you know, or something like that. Uh, These new psychic spaces. So, I mean, I, I had not... I had never heard that part of very long. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of some of his, some of his work, um, especially, I mean, that, that's a really interesting interpretation and very similar to the Vedic understanding of the yugas where we become more and more in form over different yugas. I mean, that's also fairly compatible with human design in the sense that the story of, of human life effectively moves from the mental into the physical, you know, through the quarters, mm. quarter of initiation, mm. quarter of civilization, quarter of duality, quarter of mutation. That quarter of initiation is this mental quarter, purpose fulfilled through mind. Mm. And it's not until the material accumulates. Um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, it's it's like, I that's an interesting but isn't idea. Isn't the quarter of initiation? Sorry, I'm just. Yeah. This is kind of a tangent, maybe. But isn't that's the quarter of initiation the um, base four quarter? The bases are, you know, it's been really confusing to me why the bases are off the numbers because I always, I misspoke in previous Human Design Catalyst probably or in a different video. And then I noticed because I was like, wouldn't quarter of duality be um, yin yin? Because it's made so much sense, but it's not. Oh, no, yin yin is definitely Gavi civilization because it's the building of the Maya. Okay, well, then that does make sense to me now, but it's just funny that um, that if, if that's yin yin, then quarter of duality is base four. Mm and it's the quarter of initiation that's base one. And I, I mean, sorry, quarter of mutation, excuse me. The quarter of mutation it's is base, base one. For sure. Yeah. Because Hades, yeah. Yeah. And it's just but interesting. Ap- but then initiation is... Base two, which is such a weird it idea. Is? Which is so mine. So it is compatible. With oh, well, but I guess... I thought oh, quarter but of initiation was base four. No, it's the other okay. way around. Okay, then... And we, we can edit this out. Or you can edit whatever we want. That's fine. No, that's it's fine. fine. It's, yeah, no, it is... Sure. Well, let's look. <laughs> No, I mean I don't. I don't know. 
So what's a gate and uh, okay gate? Just look at the rate model. Gate thirty six is one. Because we know that it. We know it well, gate thirty six is one that's in the quarter of mind. So that maybe I'll see the hexagram. <laughs> Everything about the hexagram. <laughs> and it was literally just all like sex and like S and M and stuff. Gate thirty six. No way you're getting into when you look up gate thirty six. So that's yin in the service of yang. So that's yeah, gate two. Gate two. I mean, I'm sorry, base two. Base two. Yeah, yeah, base two. two. And it's in. It's in the quarter of mind. Yeah, I, okay. I know that because right. Pisces. Cool. Pisces is in the. Right yeah, which is so weird to think of Pisces as so mental in that mind. But anyway, lots of interesting things here. Okay. okay. Well, I think we can wrap it up. I will just say my my last two interesting ones. Did you know that the babies born between the September fifth of twenty twenty one. To April 15th, 2022, are all manifesting generators. Yes, I did know this. Okay. <laughs> Next one's raw Enneagram. What is raw's Enneagram type? Oh, I don't know. Um, eight? That's what I think. I think raw's an Enneagram eight. What do you think? Put it in the comments. <laughs> Sound off. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone.